And if you've listened to this podcast or radio show before, we thank you for listening. If you're listening to this show for the first time, please subscribe, like, and share this interview. It's with an amazing person. We're going to talk about her in a minute. But we do uh, interview amazing people that have done amazing things throughout the country even and even around the world. So thanks so much. Uh, we ha I'm honored to have you on today. And this is Temple Grandin. She's authored many books, over 60 sci scientific articles. And she was also big in the meat processing plant. She's going to talk about that too. And she also authored a book that I definitely want to speak about, uh, The Autistic Brain. So Temple, thanks so much for coming on. Greatly appreciate your time today. And well, it's really good to be here today. All right. So let's kick this around and talk about this, Temple. For people that don't know about you, can you give a short synopsis of who you are and what you've done? Well, I'm a professor of animal science at um, Colorado State University. I've been there for a lot of years. Worked with uh, cattle behavior, designing facilities, animal behavior specialists, worked on improving animal welfare. I also was, uh, had autism when I was a little kid. Uh, no speech until age, uh, age four. Got into really good early education. I can't emphasize that enough. You got little kids that are not talking. You got to get working with them like right now. Don't wait. You grew up in the 50s and the 60s. A lot of people didn't really know at that time what autism was. How did your family deal with that? Well, my mother um, took me into the pedi pediatrician who referred me to a neurologist, mm -hmm. Dr. Bronson Crothers, a very excellent neurologist. And uh, he checked me out for epilepsy. I had no signs of epilepsy. Check me and make sure I'm not deaf. Just want to say, if you have little kids that aren't talking, you've got to rule out depth. So that's the first thing you've got to test for that. And he referred me to a little speech therapy school when I was two and a half years old. They did very, very good early programming, just like they do today. Right. The thing that I have observed is a good teacher. There's a teacher that have the ability. They know how to work with these kids. They had to push just a little bit to get progress, but not do something like drive them into sensory overload. My teacher would slow down when she talked to me. Because when grown-ups talked fast, it went into gibberish. I went a little bit, just sounded like that. She also taught me how to take turns at games, how to wait and take turns. That's um, uh, that's really important. Uh, and then there was a little uh, school. There was about six kids in it, and I think she had about two Downs kids in the in the nursery school, and the others. She, the uh, doctor, originally just said I had kind of minimal brain damage. They, he didn't know what autism was, but I went into a very good early intervention program. I had all the full autism symptoms, and then that that, that word came up a few years later. Right. I, I do want to dive into the book, though, that you wrote, uh, because I read it, and, and I really enjoyed it. Here. Yeah, The Autistic Brain. Can you speak about that book? Yes. Um, one of the things to cover in that book in detail is sensory issues. Right. Right. Sensory issues really are real. They also are very variable. I had problems with sound sensitivity, like loud sounds would hurt my ears. So bell, mm -hmm. the school bell would go off. It's like a dentist drill hitting a nerve. Sure. Uh, now, sometimes you can help a kid get over that sound sensitivity if you let them press the button that rings the bell. You know, you do that after hours. Or play with the vacuum cleaner or the hair drum or some other really loud thing where they turn it on and off. And then there's other individuals that have visual processing problems. And there's some kids that are dyslexic that have these problems. And when they go to read, the print jiggles on the page. Uh, in some of the severe cases, the uh, visual images break up. Mm -hmm. uh, like a, uh, the old satellite TVs, you get that pixelation. Like these, these uh, Zoom conferences, uh, they just freeze and crash. They don't, doesn't break up the same way. But those satellite TVs, you get all those little pixelations Mm. And there's some people on the spectrum that describe that exact kind of thing because the brain's not putting the graphics files together right. Um, I don't have that problem. And they can have problems with certain LED lights that flicker. Um, that, that can be really uh, bad, but it's very variable. And it can be really debilitating. And I read a really interesting paper on treating sensory problems. It's called Environmental Enrichment is an effective treatment for autism. It's an adjunct of other therapies. 
and you stimulate two senses at the same time, like maybe touch and smell, the aromatherapy, and then you touch a, a smooth cloth, or you might do music and, and touch a rough piece of carpet. You're always stimulating two senses at the same time and always changing them. It seems like, and, and we can go into your story too on this, it seems like when they you know, see animals, whether it's a dog, uh, where it's a service dog, or even yeah. uh, a dolphin. We've seen dolphin therapy for people uh, yeah. that have uh, severe disabilities in general. Uh, you know, horses, horseback riding. I know you you dabbled into horseback riding while you were younger. Uh, can you talk about that? What is What do you feel like is that connection uh, between someone that has, you know, severe autism or autism in general with animals such as like with you, cattle, horses, uh, dolphins, with other people and dogs. Animals don't think in language. You see, mm -hmm. I think in pictures. Animals sure. live in a sensory based world. And uh, so when I did my very first work with cattle, I went and looked in the chutes to see what they were seeing as they walked through the chutes. Other people are thinking language don't think to do that. There's something like maybe a jacket on the fence or a bright sunbeam on the floor that would make the cattle stop. Mm -hmm. Now I can make checklists to help people find these things. But when I first started doing this um, in my twenties, I didn't know I thought in pictures. I thought everybody thought in pictures the way I think. Right. Well, I've since learned that that's not true. Some people think in pictures, some people are more mathematical and some people are words. And uh, I think there's some word thinkers that will say that an animal's not conscious because they can't imagine true thought without words. See, but I can think without words. Right, because I always see that connection. I know that, um, you know, with people with disabilities that have service dogs, <laughs> as far as autism, um, Asperger's, yeah. uh, it seems like it's just a more and maybe it's just the animal that they have that a uh, better connection than you know a, a human would that doesn't have a disability do you agree with that or well there's some uh, what i've found with uh, kids with uh, with animals people, you know kids with autism is some a lot of them love them mm -hmm. some of them are a bit afraid at first and then you love them mm -hmm. and then you have a few where there's a sensory problem you never know when the dog might bark or the horse might win and mm -hmm. so uh they're afraid of them because they're they're not uh, uh, always predictable from a sensory standpoint. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, as we move on, I, I want to just reiterate who this is. This is Temple Grandin. She has authored many books, also authored 60 scientific articles, and we're going to move more into this uh, as far as autism goes and your whole life story in general. Uh, there's so much mis- uh, were, you know, mis as far as the wording is wrong and misdiagnosis of people that do not have autism. Do you feel like that's a, just a problem in America? Is that a doctor's issue? Is that just a parent issue where if well, the, the kid problem, is... The problem ahead. is it's a behavioral profile. It's yeah. not a hard diagnosis like COVID variants where right. they can go do a genomic test tell you exactly which variant of COVID that you are, that you're infected with. That is a scientific hard diagnosis. Autism is a profile. And the problem is, as it's been broadened, going from the person with no speech delay, the Asperger type, socially awkward with no speech delay, that's been merged in mm. with all the other autism. Because in the previous guidelines, I'm not even going to call them diagnosis, I'm going to call them guidelines, um, the, you had to have speech delay. Mm -hmm. Plus, have the have the social issues to be autistic, mm -hmm. and then the other end of the spectrum, you get very, very severe. Mm -hmm. Now, on the mild end of the spectrum, you're going to be socially awkward, but you may be really smart, and oftentimes you have um, sensory issues, sound sensitivity, touch sensitivity. Some people might have visual sensitivity, um, and there's kind of three kinds of thinking. You can be an object visualizer like me. And I, my kind of thinking I described in my book, um, Thinking in Pictures, and then, or some of uh, mathematicians, a visual spatial mathematician, and then you have the word thinkers. And in the autistic brain, I discuss the science behind the different kinds of thinkers. 
Now, most people are kind of mixtures, but you get someone with an autism label, they might be an extreme visual thinker or an extreme mathematician, or maybe <coughs> very verbal love history and really good at facts. But it's a continuous trait. This is the problem. Then you get into some of the very severe things that are labeled um, autistic. And some of those may actually have a diagnosis that genetically would be more precise. I've been completely genome scanned and I found out why my teeth are terrible, my skin are terrible, uh, my health problems, that all showed up in the gen genome scan. The autism, I just have a few at-risk genes because the problem is the same genes that make the human brain big also cause autism and schizophrenia. And they're kind of opposites from a developmental standpoint. Mm. Then you get into some of the severe um, autism. I just got asked to do a talk at, at the Dupe 15Q Association. And these are kids that show autistic behavior, but tend to have really bad epilepsy. And uh, it too has some spectrum. And I'm going to suspect that the Dup 15Q Society has some of the, the more, most severe of that spectrum. It's where some genes kind of get mixed around. Um, and But on the fully verbal end of the spectrum, it's a totally continuous trait. And I think uh, scientists are a little bummed out that um, they're not finding the autism gene. Because I did this paper on the genome scanning with LionGen. And it got sent to like five journals, top journals, they rejected it. And I think they had a very hard time accepting the idea that this is continuous. And when you go on some of the uh, autism scanning um, uh, for, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether the parents are going to be at risk of having an autistic child, they don't even come up positive on that. Now, brain scan data does show, yeah, where the social deficits are. And uh, big, huge visual thinking circuits I've got in my brain. But on the... You see, at one place, it's just a, it's just a behavior, behavior variation. You take a Silicon Valley head of a big company, it's probably autistic. They avoid the label. And, and uh, there's a point where it just becomes a personality variant. Now, obviously, I had severe speech delay. Mm. Obviously, that's not normal. But then you have all the Asperger types where there's no speech delay, so they all merged into this now. So you really have kind of a, a it's gotten so broad it's really ridiculous and the right. kind of uh, education and services you need to be different. Now, the thing that's the same, whether it's me going into therapy or one of these kids with this Duke 15 Q that's got uh, having bad epilepsy and have to have quite a, you know, maybe have a drug or two to control the bad epilepsy. Early therapy is the same. You got little kids that aren't talking. I don't, it doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. You got little kids that aren't talking. They got a lot of repetitive behavior. The worst thing you can do is to do nothing. You've got to work with them. Now, the thing that's interesting about the Duke 15 Q is those kids actually tend to be more social, more likely to have intellectual impairment and be, um, be more social. But if you work with them, they're going to improve a whole lot. They also tend to have more motor problems. But any little kid that's got any kind of a neurological problem, you've got to work with them. Right. They've just got to work with them. And the earlier, the better. And the more you work with them, the better they get. I also found an interesting paper on the mouse model for autism. They've got mice that they've modified genetically. And when you put these mice in an enriched environment, they get more social, they do better. Mm. And, and one of the worst things you could do with a young kid with an autism label is just let them play with electronics all day and just veg out. You've got to work with them. And uh, they need to get out and do a lot of things. Now you do have to be careful about sensory overload. If he's screaming when you go to the train station, no, then I might have to have a headphone. Right. Uh, but then you might be able to get them to tolerate the train station. Say, now you can have the headphone with you. Give them control. Have it with you. Not only wear it if you have to, but it's there if you have to wear it. You've got it there. See, that gives them control. Um, but... Uh, you know, it, it's a real problem. You've got little kids that are not talking. You've got to start therapy early. Now, I just talked to a lady from Nigeria. I was on a big international um, conference with a big corporation on their diversity committee. And a lady from Nigeria was on, on there. And there's no services. I said, go to the grandmothers in the community 
and Kevin Cummings, she had a two-year-old, and start working with them, playing little turn-taking games, engaging them, take them out for walks. And, and you're going to find that some grandmothers have the ability to work for this kid. I found some teachers have the ability and some don't. Yeah. But don't just let them sit in the corner. Because the worst thing you can do is to do nothing. Do you feel like it's an issue, and you kind of brought this up earlier in the interview, that it's a lot of these parents, uh, you know, they're more into themselves, more into their own work. Uh, they feel like their kids have a disability for the majority of them, and they feel like they're going to do what they can uh, as far as, the, I should say, the school is going to do what they can while they're at school. And when they come home, just give them the video games. Oh, give them no, the no, no, no. I think video games are the worst thing. No, they right, but I'm saying on video games is really, really right. ugly. But I'm saying that the parents are, uh, they don't really care and to work with the kids, such as we're saying, to make sure that they go out and work, make sure that they go out and volunteer. And they just say, well, they feel like their kid, like you said, is buying into more of the label. And they say, well, my kid can't do it. Just give him the video games and the computer so he'll be quiet or she'll be well, quiet. That's the problem. But the problem right. is I've, I'm having grandfathers coming up to me all the time before COVID started. I was doing these and I would talk about grandfathers and they'd come up to me after the meeting and the grandfather would find out that he was on the autism spectrum after the kids got diagnosed and he's a NASA space scientist or a programmer wow. for a, a company um, or an accountant or some other decent job. But every one of those granddads had a paper round at age 11. You right. see, they learned how to work and we've got to do paper route substitutes. Okay, how about church and synagogue jobs? We can start that at age 11. Now, of course, COVID's made a mess out of that. But um, there's, uh, uh, well, I go all around the country and I know that uh, there are a lot of churches that are 11 years old. You're going to help set up the food now. Yeah. COVID, of course, wrecked that. But I'm um, finding those opportunities where you've got to do a job on a schedule. Somebody outside the family is the boss. That's really important. And, and I'm going to call them paper route substitutes. You see, this is the problem we got with autism. We're going from an Asperger type with no speech delay. They're running Silicon Valley. And then you've got somebody uh, that's got a lot more problems with, with all kinds of uh, different types of epilepsy. I just actually was looking up some of the drugs right now for Duke-15Q uh, to learn more about it. And those kids get autism labels yeah. because they've got some of the, you know, some of the behaviors of, of autism. Temple, how do we get rid of this perspective that somebody with a disability is uh, only a person that's in a wheelchair with a person that has lost limbs uh, instead of, you know, anybody could have a disability. They don't have to look the part. You can have dyslexia. That's right. a disability. Steven Spielberg was dyslexic. Um, my teacher, when I was in elementary school, I managed to get through elementary school without being bullied. Because my teacher explained to the other children in the elementary school that it had a disability that was not visible like a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And that they needed to be helping me. Now, high school was a nightmare for bullying and chasing. Mm -hmm. It was just absolutely, absolutely horrible. But my third grade teacher back in the 50s, Mrs. Deach, you know, recognized that, you know, that, you know, these older, really good teachers. I had my speech teacher, it was Mrs. Deach. My mother was always pushing me to do new things. My ability in art was always encouraged and I, and I was encouraged to do lots of different kinds of art, not just the same thing over and over again. So, so let me ask you this, Temple. Uh, you talked about being bullied a lot through high school. If you were to go up to one of these people today and you saw them that bullied you, what would you say to them now? Well, the thing that's interesting is I've had a lot of people from my childhood come to, to, uh, forward to me at meetings. None of the bullies have come forward. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, that's how it is. They don't want, they're afraid yeah. now to come out. <laughs> yeah. It's because somebody like you that's so accomplished, and they probably are not as accomplished as you, so <laughs> they're afraid to come out of the woodwork. How do you feel like the U.S. is doing with helping people with disabilities compared to the rest of the world? Well, there's a lot of things where, you know, we've been a leader in compared to the, to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. I've, I've traveled around the world. Okay, take things like ramps. 
Well, I'm calling the developing country and there's a ramp that somebody hand built, you know, for a wheelchair. Sure. So there are some things where it's getting better. Uh, I was the kind of child with the symptoms I had that we would have normally just been put in an institution mm -hmm. because I looked real severe. Now, mm -hmm. fortunately, I went to a neurologist and the first thing she did was check for epilepsy. And the report came back that it did not have any sign of epilepsy. And that usually is, is from a severity standpoint, a really good sign. Um, and we're working, we've done a whole lot of progress on early intervention. Mm -hmm. That's something we've really worked on. Now, where we're falling down is the transfer to adulthood. And this, I hate, I think shopping's boring to talk about, but I find I've got to talk about basic skills. Right. Okay, I learned to drive. It took a whole lot longer because of the multitasking issue. 200 miles on dirt roads before I wow. did any, any uh, traffic because you've got to get the operation of the car into motor memory where I don't have to think about steering or the brakes or the gas pump. Um, it's going to take a lot longer. You know, so you take that time and you do it and start starting a giant parking lot or an open field. Totally safe place. That's where you start. Right. No, I agree with you 100%. So let's go into cattle. What drove your interest in cattle from the start? This, uh, it's a very basic thing on how do people get into careers. Students get into careers they get exposed to. I came from a non-ag background with, um, uh, uh, no experience with agriculture. And when I was uh, a teenager, mm -hmm. I got exposed to cattle. I got exposed. Uh, I've, been, I've looked up some stuff on Michelangelo. There's a possibility he was autistic. But when he was a child, exposed to art, all the churches were commissioning art. And he grew up in a family that used stone cutting tools. See, that's exposure to the tools and exposure to what you would make with the tools. But this is true for lots of careers. You don't get interested in stuff you're not exposed to. And one of my big concerns today when these kids are getting addicted to video games is yeah. they're not getting exposed to enough stuff to find stuff they might want to do for a career. I think one of the worst things the schools have done, they take out cooking, sewing, woodworking, art, theater, yes. music. How can you find out you're good with musical instruments if you never play them? Yep, I was exposed to musical instruments. I couldn't play the little flute, but another kid will pick that up and just play it. Right. But you've got to get some exposure to this stuff. Yeah, it's really sad, like you said, because that could help. And you brought this up throughout the interview. That could help a lot of these kids that... Uh, have autism, a lot of kids that don't have autism, learning that mm -hmm. trade, making money off that trade uh, in general, you know, making money off music, if that's the case. Oh, that's Art, right. and I, uh, I work with brilliant, skilled people in machinery design yep. and skilled trades that own big metal fabrication companies, 20 patents, and they're autistic, dyslexic, um, special ed department builds the stuff. And taking those classes out, I think it's the worst things that's happened yeah. and there's a tenant say just stick the nose up at the skilled trades and say you have to go to college yeah. but um we've got whole things in industry like a poultry processing plant for example that we have to import over here in 100 shipping containers because we're not making this stuff anymore and that's that goes back to our educational system uh, there's two parts of engineering you've got the clever engineering department and then you've got the more mathematical stuff really interesting the food processing plant food designs of different parts of these big factors uh, the more mathematicians they do the boilers and refrigeration roof snow load that sort of stuff my kind of mind makes all the clever equipment that's mechanically clever that goes inside the factory so you know obviously being a woman in a man's world as far as you know cattle how was that i mean it must have been increasingly hard with, you know, these men walking around thinking that they know everything and you coming in there and just kicking butt. Well, being a woman was a much bigger barrier than autism. Ever. Right. And uh, I had to make myself really good. And the thing that got shocked me as I got into industry is the amount of guys that uh, they would try to do something without having the right knowledge and make a multi-million dollar mistake. Uh, I could have a factory shut down because they build it without enough wastewater treatment. And they were told it didn't have enough wastewater treatment. <laughs> it's incredible that when yeah, people, um, they don't listen just because somebody's race or sex or whatever it may be, 
It's it's really incredible. So, you know, what was a huge problem that you saw in the processing plants in the 70s and 80s well, when you were working? The biggest problem when I first started out was just real rough hand cap. Uh, getting them just really rough. You know, electric prods all over them, running them. Oh. And, and, uh, and, but there were a few places that did things right. Mm -hmm. So I got really interested in cattle handling. I got really interested in designing equipment. The other thing I learned um, is when I was young, I made the mistake of thinking I could solve all the problems if I just built the right equipment. Yeah. Well, I've since learned I can fix half the things with the right equipment and the other half's management. And it, this is a common mistake in the engineering that, you know, I, my first professional association was Ag Engineering Association um, that engineers make is they think they can fix everything with technology. Let's look at schools. Okay, a smart board doesn't replace a good teacher. That's right. You know, basically, when it comes to a lot of things, what would you rather have? Adequate facilities with really good management, really good teachers, or state-of-the-art with poor management or poor teachers. I'll take the adequate. It has to be at least adequate. I'll tell you something. It's not an adequate cattle handling facility. Forklift pallets tied together with string is not an adequate cattle handling facility. Yeah, you so, do have to have something better than that. So obviously you made huge impressions throughout your time uh, with these farmers, with these catalysts. With that said, what do you feel like was your biggest accomplishment in that field? Well, I have two things. I have equipment I've designed. It's a piece of equipment called the Center Track Restrainer System that I worked on developing. It's in every mm -hmm. one of the big plants. You can look it up on Beef Plant Video Tour with Temple Brandon. I did that work in the 80s and the early 90s. Yeah. You know what's very frustrating? Half my clients tore stuff up, up and wrecked it. Then I developed a very simple assessment system where you measure five simple things in a slaughter plant, like stunning efficacy, make sure they're all unconscious, mm -hmm. uh, vocalization, electric prod score, slipping and falling. You measure these very simple things and no acts of abuse. They're outcomes of either something wrong with equipment or something wrong with how it's operated. Yeah. And when I taught McDonald's, Wendy's, and Burger King how to use that system, I saw more change. This was in 1999 than I'd seen in my whole career. And the thing that was amazing is we took some older places that were a bit shabby, and after doing some repairs and, and some management, we got them to work okay. Mm. It's amazing what maintenance and management can do. And then simple changes, non-slip flooring. You've got to have that. Lighting. Oh, they're scared of the dark. Put a light on a shoot. They'll go right in. Move a light, make the reflection go away. They'll go right in the chute. Put up a piece of cardboard in the right place. Works like magic. I call it <laughs> lights and cardboard trick. And sometimes I can't even believe, believe it works as well as it does. Use behavior. And that time, um, uh, we really want to bring about change. Large buyers have the power to bring about change. But we need to be bringing about practical change. And another reason why it was effective I was not shoving equipment down my throat. Yeah. We took some places that were kind of old and we made them work. Now, out of the 75 plants that were on the McDonald's food supplier list, three did have to do an entire front end remodel. And that was very expensive. But that's three out of 75. Mm -hmm. All the others, oh, a little non-slip flooring put in the right place. It works like magic. You bring 10 cattle up at a time, not 20. Mm -hmm. Just things like that. Stop yelling. Get the electric pods out of your hand. And then three places had to have a manager me. We had to remove the plant manager. And then things changed overnight. Can we talk about innovation in the industry? Now, you talked about, obviously, all the innovation that you made throughout your time working in the industry in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. With that said, uh, what do you feel like is the best innovation that these companies are doing now as far as cattle? We hear a lot about all this plant-based uh, proteins with in hamburgers now. Uh, do you feel like that's the innovative stuff they're doing? Well, or? They gotta look right. at. It. Okay, you, there's two ways you can you can culture meat sure. and grow it, mm. or you could uh, use a vegetable products. Now you look at the ingredients list. I've picked those up, looked at the ingredients list. I know a lot about supply chain management, and each ingredient has trucks that have to bring it in. It right. has a supply chain. Okay, at least with the cattle. You just got to get the cows go in one end of the plant and meat and the other stuff comes out the other end. 
Right. But the only thing that goes in is cattle right. or pigs or sheep. Where if I'm making a veggie burger, I've got a lot of, you know, get different grains, peas, I get lentils. So I have a bunch of different stuff. And is it as energy efficient as you think it is? Mm. The other thing I'm getting very interested in is um, sustainable grazing practices. Because if you use grazing animals correctly, they can improve the land. The right pasture rotations or rotating cattle um, uh, cover crop. Um, you know, you, you plant a crop that the cattle can eat and put them on the fields. And then maybe the following year, you put corn or soybeans on. Right. Where, and then you're using the, the manure and it's truly organic. You use the grazing animals right, you can improve the land. You use them wrong, you can wreck the land. Yeah. But we're going to have to look at some of these, um, you know, each ingredient has to have trucks, maybe in some cases trains, but probably trucks to haul it. Well, look at the, um, um, a lot of people don't know where stuff comes from. We had that mess with the Ever Given getting stuck in the Suez Canal. And she had a lot of laptops and other electronics on her. I, she's tied up in a lawsuit right now. We're going to have to check with the internet and see if they, if they got it moving yet. But they were squabbling over a getting paid for getting it out of there. Right. But what's on those containers? You've got clothing, you've got shoes, you've got right. um, uh, medical equipment that you might really need. Yeah. There's just all kinds of stuff on there. And the, the, the thing that's, uh, I've written some stuff about big is fragile. All right, right, whether it's the ever given or whether it's a big beef sl uh, slaughter plant, a big plant gets what's called economy of scale. Each container or each steer cost less to process. But mm -hmm. when it break it, you're in more trouble. So you got stuck in the canal and when COVID shut down some of the plants with pigs, we were in a lot of trouble. And a lot of pigs just had to be destroyed out on the farm using some methods that were not very nice. Yeah. And it was also a huge waste of food. Right. And we need to be planning so that that um, kind of a mess doesn't happen again. In beef right now, people have been building smaller plants and distributing the supply chain. But the problem we've got, and I don't care if it's on um, what the product is you're shipping or what, what the food is, if I go with a more distributed supply chain, it's more robust. In other words, it won't break as easily, but it will be more expensive. Mm. Now look at the mess the car industry's in right now where they can't get electronic chips because right. there's a fire in a factory burned up the chip factory. And I'm... Um, uh, everybody was going for cheap, cheap, cheap economy of scale. And now they can't, they got to shut down the car factories because they don't have a little electronic chips to put in them. Yeah, right. Yeah, you see, this is, is the problem. Everything has a supply chain. Now, as a visual thinker, none of this is abstract. But now COVID broke a bunch of stuff. So now people are going, hmm, huh, there's, shit, there's no toilet paper. The shelves are stripped. Uh, big, right. fragile, it's very efficient. A big, pack, a big slot, beef slaughter plant can work extremely efficiently, can be very, very good welfare, very, very good food safety if it's run right. They can really work really right. But when it breaks, you're in trouble. And we had another plant before COVID where they, the room where they stored the cardboard boxes got on fire and it damaged the um, pre-stressed concrete in the roof. And that was an expensive wow. mess. And it was shut down and the cattle market gyrated. Uh, now, fortunately, cattle, the advantage you got it with cattle is if I have to hold them, I can feed them a hand. Pigs, they're monogastric like us. When they're ready, they're ready. And chickens are a shorter cycle. So the amount of chicken they had to destroy was way, way less. But we had the storms in Texas. Yeah. And then um, I was just talking to a friend in Texas and you know the restaurants had a wing shortage. Well, and they had that storm and the power went off and the generators run out of diesel and all the hatchery goes down. Are you worried about shortages coming back now? Because we're hearing a lot of this stuff about truck drivers. I mean, you just talked about uh, transportation and all this, uh, and how you know we got to get places from one place to another. One so, are you worried we're going to do Go is not think about this stuff abstractly. Sure. One thing that COVID's done. You, I remember hearing an interview, and it was before COVID happened, uh, where a lady was some interview I heard on a radio. Some lady. There had been a big storm in the southeast. Mm. I don't remember which one, but I remember her on the radio. And I was driving somewhere, probably to the airport. And she said, I wasn't scared until I went to Walmart and the shelves were stripped. And right. then I got scared. You see, now 
you know, the truck didn't come with mm -hmm. stuff. We had some big floods here that, that, that blocked the interstate a few years ago. I, you know, it's making people think about it. You know, this is why I think a lot of people are getting interested in local, support local. Right. It's a lot more robust. They can do a great job, but I think shipping people right now are thinking about, should you have these big container ships? They're building more of them. I looked I, it up, she's got big sisters, they're even bigger. She had 9,000 truckloads of, of freight on her. Yeah. A lot so of that she, stuff went bad and or they had well, animals oh, on Well, they're not gonna put produce on it. It's gonna be, uh, you know, Ikea furniture, uh, mm. shoes, clothing, okay. kitchenware, pots and pans. They, they, um, they posted some of the uh, manifest, someone got into the manifest and they posted like electronics was the biggest percentage of stuff that was on there. And then it was household goods, furniture and clothing. Yeah. And now if they don't get that out of there and you've got laptops on that top tier of containers and you leave them in that, yeah. that they're late for summer, they'll be wrecked. Yeah. It's crazy. I, I mean, it, it's, I, I think they're going to get it out of there. I looked at the, um, the website yesterday and I, but this is, see, the reason, see, what happened is Egypt wants to get paid. So they impounded the ship. But guess what? They can't unload the cargo in Egypt because they do not have a big enough crane to unload the cargo. So oh, now they're going to have to figure something else out. It has to go to a really big port to unload the cargo because he's so big. Right. Yeah. What's an ideal day for you? An ideal day? Well, some of the... I really like getting stuff done. I get very happy when a mom sends me an email. Said, well, 10 years ago, I went to one of your talks and now my kid's married and has a house and a job. You know, he's an autistic kid. That makes me happy. And I get that. Um, I was really happy when I built stuff and we made it work. That made me happy. I get happy making real stuff work where now I think I picked that up from 25 years in heavy construction when I was out on these construction projects. You got to get probably projects done. You got to make them work. And, and I'm kind of approached. I want to see somebody on the autism spectrum the best life that they can have and, and uh, do real things. You see, the verbal thinkers get way too abstract. Visual thinkers are not abstract. You know, we talk about broad concepts, but I would rather... The things I worked on, okay, I've started out, okay, I'm gonna design better equipment for handling cattle. Okay, that's something specific. Mm. It's not um, something general. I, I have a, someone said, well, I wanna do social justice. Well, I'm gonna think something specific. Okay, I'm gonna use DNA testing to show that this person who's in prison is innocent. You see, that's something specific. And yes. you can actually really make a difference. It's not general. Okay, and then I developed a way to assess the, the slaughter clients that worked. So it's very simple to train people to do it. And then it forced them to main, do maintenance and to manage the places. But you see, that's something specific. It's not the whole world. Right. You see, the problem with a lot of big verbal theory, and this again, education is really bad on this. Okay, everybody's gonna go to college. Now we're paying the price. I go through a chicken processing plant in 2019 and I'm going, hmm, all the equipment's for Holland. And that's because they kept their skilled trades. Mm -hmm. And I went to the Steve Jobs Theater, structural glass walls, Italy and Germany, carbon fiber roof from the Middle East. I tracked down the vendors that made that stuff. Um, because one of the big things I'm working on now is I'm concerned that a lot of the kids like me that are different are going nowhere because they took this stuff out of the schools. See, yeah. I had that stuff. It's terrible, again, the way they're doing this. And they're, again, they're hurting kids because these kids uh, could be getting mm -hmm. these jobs. These are good paying jobs. So not it's- They go away. They're not going to get replaced by computers. Right. The other problem with the visual thinkers like me, we can't do algebra. And I've never have passed an algebra course. Thank goodness in 67, when I took college math, it was more statistics and probability. Right. And- with tutoring, I was able to do that. But I'm explaining that we need our, our visual thinkers. You know, we've got infrastructure falling apart. We've got too much stuff that's just a lot of vague theory. How do you actually do something? 
and then it breaks. So all the people that got all that freight, there's um, I, that ship. That, I even learned the container ship stuff. I find it interesting. She can hold 20,020 equivalents, which is half size containers. And she's 90% full, mostly 40 footers on her. So that's about 9,000 truckloads. That's not abstract. And I'm thinking about all the different things. You go in the store and you look in the store. That happens Amazing. to be from China. If it's from China, it could be on that ship. You see, that's, that's not abstract. Right. I've had people ask me, like, what would be on it? Really? Yeah. Yeah. You didn't meet. It's obvious. You know, we got young people today don't even know what a container ship is. <laughs> and I think this is a problem right. when, when we're looking at making policy. You could be making policy about something because you don't even know what it is. And what, what other interesting thing I learned, because I worked at every major meat company on this and I am working with people on these welfare meats, is called making the suits come out of the office. And you get high up management out there seeing bad stuff. And now welfare, that used to be the big abstraction, give it to the PR, give it to the uh, uh, lawyers, now becomes real. I'll never forget the day and a half dead dairy cow marched into one of the McDonald's plants and they saw it and they were horrified. And you might want to look at Bob Langer's book, uh, The Battle to do, do good, to do Good. He's the guy who hired me. Now I want to emphasize that was about 25 years ago. Um, and when the suits get out of the office and they see stuff, it's no longer an abstraction. They're going, oh, we've got to do things. So I'm going to my book, The Outdoor Scientist, because we need to be getting kids outside actually doing stuff because we have to find practical solutions to problems. And I'm worried about what I call abstractification, where it all becomes an abstraction. We also need to thank the tugboats crews. They didn't get enough crew, enough credit for working together, pushing and pulling in unison. That's not easy. And got that ship out of there and it didn't tip over and it wasn't wrecked. Yeah, they need credit. And one of the news networks did give one of the crews credit. I was very happy to see that. Mm. Because you, you couldn't have gotten it out without those tugboats and their crews. Right. I, I want to talk uh, quickly with the last few uh, audience questions. Now, they did make a HBO film about you. How accurate was that movie? Because I, I know that when they make movies about people, some of it's accurate, some of it's not. How accurate was the movie that they made about you on HBO? Well, the visual thinking was shown completely accurately. That mm. It showed how I think. And it also had all my projects. They were accurate. They built, you know, working replicas of all of the projects. The main characters, like Mr. Carlock, um, he really was a NASA space scientist. Anne and my mother were shown really nicely. Um, yeah, there's some stuff they exaggerated. That horse was nowhere near as wild as what they showed there. But they, the things that are really important, it showed sensory stuff really well. And Claire Danes sort of became me because I gave her all these ancient old VHS tapes and she had them put on CDs and she listened to them and listened to them and listened to them. And it was, I remember a really uh, weird time I was listening to an interview on N NPR and I was pulling into the parking lot at the university and they were interviewing Claire Danes and they were taking, well, they were taking scenes from the movie on NPR and interviewing me. So sometimes it's me talking in an interview and then Claire Danes and I mixed them up. <laughs> I was just pulling into parking place behind our animal science building. I can't remember where I was when I heard that. That was weird. Yeah. So you think she played you very well then? She did a very good job of playing me. Very, very good job. And I think it's important for people to see how visual thinking works. And Mick Jackson, the director, got that right. And Emily Gerson Sainz is the mother of a child with severe autism. She wanted to have it right. Yeah. You know, yeah, and there's a little things that are wrong, but that's not the real important stuff. Right. So, so Claire Danes did sit with you and talk. I know you said you gave her the... Uh, Video I, did, I spent about five hours, four or five hours with Claire Danes, but I spent oh, wow. more time with the producer, the director, yeah. and the writer. Those sure. are the people I spent more time with. Okay, wow. It's That's the kind great. of thing where the right team of people gets together. 
Mm. Then a good project comes out. And I found the same thing with construction. There's a lot of similarities. The main difference is, boy, they cater. The catering tent's a five-star restaurant. You're not, you're not eating off the garbage truck. That's what we used to call one of the <laughs> catering trucks that came around one of the plants where I was there for three months. <laughs> no, I, I just had to ask that too, because I know some of these movies they make, they really exaggerate it, but I'm happy they did not exaggerate your story and they really got it correctly. Oh, and, the, and the projects like that metal plate that got put in the dip fat and those cattle died, that actually happened. Wow. And they didn't think my design would work. My projects were duplicated very accurately and my drawings even appeared in the movie, which made me happy. But Temple, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I, I do. Okay, well, thank you for having me. And it was uh, great to talk to you.